We are actually fighting many crises. Let's all make sure we're using the money we already have in the best possible way. Where you're standing right now, this entire skilling idea emerged from a World Bank conversation with the Prime Minister very early in his first tenure. India is doing a lot of things which has allowed it to stay ahead. Most countries would be very happy with the 7% growth rate in this environment. India's exposure is cushioned by the relatively higher percentage of the economy that comes from domestic consumption. Money that is to go into the system for renewable energy across the world alone is in a trillion dollars a year. If you just, you look at anybody's estimates, right? So the fact is that kind of money you cannot get from governments or multilateral banks alone, or even philanthropies. You have to get the private sector involved. The question is, we've created a private sector investment lab that will help us understand how to do this well. The fact remains you will need different forms of concessional capital. You will also need different forms of multilateral bank capital and government capital and philanthropy capital to take first risk positions or to help enable the blended finance to come through. So the real issue is, if that's what you need for renewable energy, but we're actually fighting many crises. We've got climate issues, we've got issues with fragility, conflict, pandemics and future health care needs and underlying all this we have the issue of fighting poverty and creating jobs for people. So th I think the requirements are immense. The way I have approached this is let's all make sure we're using the money we already have in the best possible way. Once we've finished that then we should come back to the richer countries and say what is your ambition for the future and how much money more are you willing to put. I think the expert group just gives you a broad idea and then we can figure out where to take this. One trillion is what Let's go to else. It's a trillion dollars just for renewable energy every year yeah. in the emerging markets. Uh, so the World Bank pointed out last year that India lost out on 400 USD billion uh, just because of the extreme measures it took for school uh, closures during the pandemic. How do you think India can make up for that? And considering World Bank has been a constant support when it comes to the education sector, what do we uh, see? You know, you've got to remember that it's not only India that closed schools for the pandemic. You, you know, the US closed schools down in a number of parts of the, of the country. So the developed and developing world was learning as this pandemic happened how to deal with it. And I think there's been learning loss across the world. So we have a real challenge for that generation that was going through schooling at that time. And it's not just India's problem alone. It's an issue across the world. My view is that we must learn. Now, we've got to fix what we've got, but we must make sure we learn for the next pandemic. Because otherwise, we'll do this again. The next one will come. It's a question of how long before it does come. That, to me, is the bigger issue. Are you spoken about, uh, the World Bank has spoken about increasing guarantees and other steps like hybrid capital and yes. global capital. Now, how soon should we expect that? Uh, that's the first part of my question. The other thing is on this private, you know, on the private investment lab, what kind of projects are you taking up? Yeah. So, the first question. Uh, what basically the process that we're following is that the evolution roadmap required us to think about all these instruments, which we're now working our way through. We're presenting them to all our shareholders, the donor countries, as well as in some cases outside philanthropies and the like. Uh, the October is when the annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF are being held in Morocco. I think that's the time when you should see uh, commitments from donor countries coming in. The U.S. has already indicated clearly, Secretary Yellen made a very clear statement, as you probably heard, that they were going to commit to some. Others have to commit. So I think you'll probably see the results of that after that. The first part of the capital expansion is taking our loan to equity ratio down from 20 to 19. That doesn't require any additional money to come in. It's our own to handle and manage. The way this works is for every billion dollars that comes in, we can increase our capacity to lend over a decade by between 5 and 7 billion, depending on the repayment pattern. So it has a very nice multiplier effect that I'm quite keen to make use of. But the other side of this is you have to have bankable projects. You know, you've got to go to countries where people are trying to set up development ideas, and you have to make sure that good quality projects are ready and available. And one of the things the bank can do, in fact, when you go travel in countries, including in India, it's not only our money. It is, of course, the stamp of good housekeeping kind of thing, but more importantly, it's our knowledge, it's our convening power, it's our ability to help inform regulatory policies, to help inform these kinds of things. Where you're standing right now, this entire skilling idea emerged from a World Bank conversation with the Prime Minister very early in his first tenure, and he kind of got hooked on it, that skilling changes the opportunity for young people. So, you know, there's more to it than the money, that's what I'm trying to get across, there's also the knowledge bank to be well worked through. 
So I don't know yet. We're going to have our first meeting soon. Uh, Mark Kani and Shriti are chairing it. Actually, Chandra of Tata Sons is one of the members. And so the idea is they'll get together once a month and we'll discuss the kind of couple of things we could do to help uh, the private sector take away some of the risks it does not understand in the emerging markets. Could be foreign exchange, could be regulatory policy, could be political risk insurance. You know, there's different aspects of it. So watch the space. It'll take a few months and then we'll see. Mr. Kala, just to ask you about the Indian economy right now. Uh, Inflation. Inflation is a problem around the world. India has its own specific issues. How immune, how resilient will India continue to be in the midst of a global slowdown? And how can India raise its share of manufacturing GDP? So you got many questions in there, right? India, one question, but which is clever. But the first question, the question about uh, inflation. One thing I would tell you, while I did say that I expect that the global economy will have challenges over the next you know, period of time, it has proven more resilient, and frankly, everybody has been proven wrong during this period. So I would be careful about assuming that people have suddenly learned how to forecast well. And in my speech, I said that forecasts are not destiny. And I think that's really important to remember. India is doing a lot of things which has allowed it to stay ahead. You've just had a great growth year. And you know, most countries would be very happy with the 7% growth rate in this environment. So I'm a little more optimistic about where this could go. My general sense is if there's a global slowdown, the one thing that India has going for it is the very high percentage of its GDP that comes from domestic consumption. Your exposure to the typical impact of global slowdowns caused by trade slowing down, caused by trade in goods as well as services slowing down, India's exposure is cushioned by the relatively higher percentage of the economy that comes from domestic consumption, which is very helpful at a time like this.